Doors opening. Doors closing. Stand back from the doors. Six stops later, I was heartily tired of people jamming into the subway car, seeing me and beating a hasty retreat. Another three stops after that, the car was mostly empty, since we had passed rapidly out of downtown. The little girl held her mother's hand and still stared at me. And there was a group of young toughs on the other end of the car, sallow in the fluorescent lights. I stood, my right arm wrapped around a pole to keep my hand free to draw if I had to. I hated sitting down in germ-laden subway seats. It's the next stop. I nodded. He still stood very close to me, the smell of demon overpowering the canned air and effluvia of the subways. I glanced down at the end of the car and saw that the young men were elbowing each other and whispering. Oh, great. It looked like another street tough was going to find out whether or not my blade was just for show. I'd never understood necromancers who carry only ceremonial steel to use during apparitions. If you're allowed to carry steel, you should know how to use it. Then again, most necromancers didn't do mercenary work. They just lived in shitty little apartments until they paid off their accreditation fees and then started trying to buy a house. Me? I decided to take the quicker way, as usual. One of them got to his feet and lumbered down the central aisle. The little girl's mother, a statuesque brunette in nurse's scrubs and Nykesy sneakers, pulled the little girl into her side again as he passed. The pimpled young man jolted to a stop right in front of me. Okay. He doesn't smell like chill or hash, which is a good thing. A street tough hyped on chill would make the situation rapidly unbearable. On the other hand, if he's stone cold sober and still this stupid... Hey, pretty baby! His eyes skittered from my feet to my breasts to my cheek, and then back to my breasts. What's up? Nothing. Ooh, you got a blade. You licensed to carry that sugar? I tilted my head slightly, presenting my cheek. The emerald glinted and winked under the harsh lights. You bet I am, and I even know how to use it. So go trundle back to your friends, Popsicle. His wet fish mouth worked a little, stunned. <laughs> what? He reached for his waistband. I had a split second to decide if he was armed or just trying to start some trouble. I never got to make the decision, though. The demon stepped past me, bumping me aside, and smacked the youngster. It was an open-handed backhand strike, not meaning to do any real damage. But it still tossed the kid to the other end of the subway car, back into the clutch of Teen Tufts. I let go of the pole as soon as I regained my balance. Oh, oh fuck. You didn't have to do that. Then one of the punk's friends pulled out a Transom 987 projectile gun. Oh, fuck. I crouched for non-existent cover. The demon moved, stepping past me, and I watched events come to their foregone conclusion. The kids boiled up from their seats, one of them yanking their injured, pimply-faced friend to his feet. They were all wearing black denim jeans and green bandanas. Yet another mini-gang. The demon blinked across intervening space. He slapped the gun, illegal if you weren't accredited or police officer, out of the boy's hand. The nurse covered her daughter's ear with her hand, staring, her mouth agape. The demon broke one boy's arm, then grabbed the gunner by the throat and held him aloft, shaking him as negligently as a cat might shake a mouse. I moved forward, coming to my feet, my sword coming free of the sheath, and slid myself in between them and the gang. You'll want to get off at the next stop. The nurse just stared at me. Trust me on this. She nodded. Her eyes were wide and wet with terror. The little girl stared at me. I turned back to find the demon standing in the center of a ring of limp bodies. I held the sword in my right hand, with the blade level across my body. The reinforced scabbard reversed along my left forearm to act as a shield. It was a highly unorthodox way to hold a katana, but Jado Sensei always cared less about orthodox than keeping alive, and I found I agreed with him. If the demon came for me, I could buy some time with the steel and a little more time with power. He'd eat me alive, of course, but I had a chance. Hello? He turned. 
Brushing his hands together as if wiping away dust. Yes. You didn't kill anyone, did you? He shrugged. That would create trouble. Is that a yes or a no? I firmed my grip on the hilt. Did you kill any of them? I didn't want to do the paperwork, even if it was a legitimate kill in response to an assault. Jaff glanced down. No, they'll live. He stepped free of the ring of bodies. Anubis and their cup. That meant Anubis protect me. The demon's lips compressed into a thin line. If he was going to attack, this would be a great time. The prince requested you delivered unharmed. He sidled to the door, not turning his back to my blade. Remind me to thank him. I wondered what other requests the prince had made. Doors opening. Doors closing. Stand back from the doors. 